In the early 2000s, Ed Escott and I published a series of articles about normal anatomic structures in the neck that can look like lymphadenopathy. So this lecture is dedicated to Ed. Here's two images from two different patients. One of these is a lymph node and one is not. Can you figure out which one is normal anatomy? Well, I'll give it away. This is the lymph node, and this is a normal piece of anatomy, but what is it that is mimicking a lymph node? Here's the full image. This is the distal thoracic duct. Recall that the thoracic duct comes up from the cisterna chile in the right paravertebral region of the abdomen, then crosses over to the left in the mid chest, and then ascends into the tracheoesophageal groove and terminates where the internal jugular vein meets the subclavian vein. It's sometimes too tiny to see, but sometimes the distal end of the duct flares out and can look like a node. This is actually visible in 50% of CTs of the neck, so if you think you're not seeing this, look more closely. Here's another example right where we expect the internal jugular vein to meet the subclavian vein. This one looks a little more like a series of tributaries, like a delta flaring out as it approaches the vascular system. This is, of course, where the chyle is returning to the vascular system. This is the recycling. Here's the same thing on MRI. You can see a flared distal thoracic duct. And if you look back, you can actually follow the duct down back into the tracheoesophageal groove. Often, when you see a dilated distal thoracic duct, if you look carefully, you can follow it halfway down the chest or further. Sometimes the duct is more tubular in configuration, like in this instance here, where we're getting it not quite at the terminus, but heading on its way there. Sometimes it's shaped more like a hot dog. All of these are normal distal thoracic ducts. They're just a little bit flared out. Sometimes the valve that separates the thoracic duct from the venous system becomes incompetent and you get reflux of contrast into the distal duct. It's this characteristic location that gives it away as the duct and not a vein. You might even be able to follow the course of the duct down into the chest more easily if it has that refluxed contrast. Okay, this is a different piece of normal anatomy. What is this mass here? Doesn't connect to anything, it's just sitting here surrounded by fat. And in fact, if you look carefully, you can see little flecks of fat inside of it. Hmm. This is normal thymus extending up into the lower left neck. Famously on ultrasound, it has a starry sky appearance, and it's usually wispy with internal fat on CT. We think nothing of this when we see it in pediatric patients, but what happens when we see it in adult patients? Here's another example. Here you get that wispy look. Does this persist into adulthood, or is this just a pediatric observation? It turns out it does persist into adulthood. In fact, when you're in your 20s, about half of people will have visible cervical thymus, but it falls off exponentially. And by the time you're in your 80s, maybe 5% of people have visible gland in their neck. This is what I mean by a wispy appearance with flecks of internal fat in a characteristic location. Be careful because this remnant thymus can give rise to all the pathology that the mediastinal gland can, including thymic carcinoma in the neck and thymoma, more well-defined, mass pushing on the thyroid gland. Okay, new topic. This one has to be a node, right? It's round, it's in a classic location, it's obviously not the artery or the vein. Well, here's the cut just below that. You can see that this mass is combining into the internal jugular vein. This is actually a, a varix, an enlarged inferior laryngeal vein. And here's an example of the anterior jugular vein. 
be a lot easier if there were contrast on this examination, but you don't always have that advantage. The veins of the neck are not as predictable as the arteries. We can draw them all out in, in beautiful uh, diagrams, but they can, the, the truth is veins can crop up in unexpected locations or be quite asymmetric in position or in caliber, and you have to be prepared for unusual locations of veins. Here's an example of an enlarged vein, a varix, in the lower neck. This frequently occurs right where the internal jugular vein meets the subclavian vein, and it is usually on the right. Probably that has something to do with back pressure from the heart. So unlike the distal thoracic duct, which is usually going to appear on the left, the, uh, the varix is usually going to appear on the right. Even with contrast, this can be a little confusing, and the asymmetry uh, uh, with the other side doesn't help. But this is a varix, and that, that is a dilated distal thoracic duct. Uh, here's the external uh, jugular vein. The external jugular vein is quite variable in size, and so when it is large, it may be mistaken for a mass. It's even more confusing when you realize that the vein is accompanied by a chain of lymph nodes that can receive metastases. But especially if you have contrast, you can follow this on sequential images and hopefully not make an error thinking that the external jugular vein is in fact a lymph node. And I can't miss an opportunity to talk about my favorite venous plexus, the pterygoid venous plexus. It's often large and asymmetric and is easily confused with tumor. I recognize this is not really a mimic of lymphadenopathy in the neck, but I just couldn't resist talking about the pterygoid venous plexus. Okay, next topic. This is a nasty looking mass. Right, it's got flecks of calcium, and it's got heterogeneous enhancement, and it's, it's right where one might expect a lymph node. Here's the same mass seen on the axial image. Right? The clue here is the erosion of bone around the sternoclavicular joint. This is all synovial proliferation around a degenerated sternoclavicular joint, and you can see more of the enlarged joint space there as well. This is easily mistaken for a mass or a node, even more so clinically than radiologically. You can often see the distortion of the skin surface here get mistaken for a mass clinically. The joint can also get infected and then it'll have a really nasty appearance with inflammation of the surrounding soft tissues. But this is all just degenerative disease in a sternoclavicular joint and is not dangerous. Painful sometimes. All right, here's an example of a different piece of normal anatomy that's been distorted. So this is a mass extending out of the lateral aspect of the neck. You can imagine that in a patient who's been treated for squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck, having this mass appear out laterally can be very concerning. And it's no less concerning on CT than it would be clinically. But this is hypertrophy of a particular muscle. When you sacrifice the 11th cranial nerve, the trapezius muscle becomes atrophy. And what takes over for the trapezius muscle? The levator scapulae muscle, which also raises the scapula. This is a hypertrophy levator scapula after cranial nerve 11 sacrifice during neck dissection. This is just a list of the things we've talked about, normal structures that can mimic cervical lymph nodes. A dilated distal thoracic duct, remember you can see it in 50% of neck CTs, so it's there. Thymus, specifically cervical thymus that has extended up into the neck and can exist throughout adult life, even though it's a normal finding and expected in children. Veins are unpredictable and can crop up in weird locations. Degenerated joints, specifically the sternoclavicular joint, can be mistaken for a mass. And muscles, particularly if they become hypertrophied or are aberrant in some way. Now, 
there are lots of pathologic masses that mimic nodal disease in the neck. Uh, benign neoplasm, schwannomas, paragangliomas, diverticula arising off of the esophagus or the trachea. But that wasn't the point of today's lecture. Today we're just talking about normal structures that can make you think lymph node, don't be fooled.